Are we in? Yep, I think we're good. Yep. All right. And we're recording so, as well, so we're good to go. Fantastic. All right, so welcome everyone to Backyard Habitats with Chris Young. I am going to um, open up a little bit. Um, some housekeeping things. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for our Lunch and Learn series. We really hope these sessions help keep our community connected during this difficult time um, as we're all coming together and learning uh, how to use Zoom and how to connect over the internet. Um, we've all been really impressed at uh, the ability of our staff and our meetings to come on and come on Zoom and the amount that we've still been able to get done from home. Um, so we're hoping these just add to that for you all. Uh, we will make these publicly available and you'll be able to find all the information on YouTube afterward, after this webinar. If you're not already a member of IEC and you're able to give, please consider joining today by using the link that we're gonna post in the chat box um, here in the next minute or so. Uh, the few housekeeping items is that you're all muted by default. If you join via Zoom, you can use the chat function that is usually over here um, on your the right side of your screen on a PC. Um, if you're using your phone, uh, it's a menu option at the bottom. Uh, to ask questions, add comments, or provide resources, you can do all of that there in the chat box. And time permitting, we'll take live Q&A at the end of this session. And then with that, I would just like to introduce Chris Young, who's with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and is our speaker for the day. And his screen is shared. Um, and so he'll go ahead and get, get us started. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, I'm going to share a little, little bit of a presentation on backyard habitats uh, and pollinating insects and talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do as individuals. A lot of the environmental issues that we, we face seem sometimes so large that it's hard to figure out how we fit in. How can we help? How can we help push things forward? How can we contribute? And I think uh, even with very, very small plots uh, in your backyard and on your property, even a flower pot on your front step, uh, you can make a little bit of a difference. And so we're gonna go over a few of those things today. I'm gonna try and keep this light and fun and creative. And if there are questions at the end, I'll try to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll try and get it for you. Uh, I don't promise to know all the answers to everything. Uh, and so I'm gonna share some resources and some thoughts and ideas. And uh, I really look forward to uh, having a, a conversation with everybody today. So we've changed the way we use our land over time. Um, as there are more and more of us, there is sometimes less space for other things. And so as we change our landscape, uh, sometimes it becomes important that we make the best possible use uh, of those spaces that are remaining. And sometimes those in our backyards, those of us who live in urban areas, I live in the, the middle of Springfield. I'm on a, on a fairly busy street uh, right now and a fairly small yard. And so right now I've just moved to this house in the last year and a half. I'm getting ready to try and figure out how to, how to make it um, as pollinator and native plant friendly as I can. So it's important to know that you can make a difference. I think that's, you know, if I have one message I could drive home to all of you today, it's that you, you can do it, you can make a difference. Um, urban areas are really taking the lead uh, as we uh, undergo land use changes in the United States, especially in the Midwest with, with agriculture and development. And, you know, we change the way um, our land is used and, and sometimes that uh, leaves less and less habitat. Uh, this is a map, a screenshot of a map from uh, St. Louis uh, they have a, a, a milkweed project there and they, they have an interactive map with every single milkweed planting that people have posted. You can click on them to see them. A lot of them are very, very modest. They may just be a few plants. Uh, they're, not, um, they're not really that impressive. They're in very urban areas with a lot of concrete, but they're still trying to provide a little bit of habitat. Uh, and as you know, monarchs are um, a candidate for federal listing right now. And that's one thing that we're working on at the department very hard is uh, plans to, um, <clears throat> to provide additional habitat and additional conservation measures to help keep the monarch from having to be listed. And that's something that you can all do to help us. So it's milkweeds for monarchs in St. Louis. Uh, another uh, fairly impressive effort that's going on is in Chicago and that's the Field Museum 
uh, in Chicago has done a lot of work and research on, on on butterflies and insects in urban areas. And so I'll share some of these resources with, uh, with our hosts after, after the presentation today, uh, some of these links so you can find them yourself if you, if you can't just turn them up. Uh, but there are a lot of great resources out there. When I was researching this program, I almost came to the conclusion like, boy, they, I don't know if they even need me. There's so much out there. There's great information on backyard gardening. There's great information on monarch conservation. Um, not only locally, but in other communities. So it's great to see what, uh, what other folks are doing. So why, why garden with native plants? I mean, we've, um, it used to be that people were in competition with each other to, to find the most interesting, different and exotic plants. Um, you know, gardeners have you know, traded plants from around the world. Uh, and so we have some of these plants that are that are from all other other countries and they've become naturalized and we're just sort of used to them and sometimes it's hard to tell what a native plant is and what a native plant is not so most of us generally we would consider a native plant one that was here uh, at the time of european settlement so that would be in the 1600s and 1700s uh, before illinois was was settled before it became a state uh, what plants were indigenous to the area at that time uh, if you really want to get wonky about it, there are even, um, there's a, a guide to uh, Illinois native plants that has a, a map of Illinois in every county on it that shows the dots in each county uh, of where all those plants were found and ones that are housed in museum collections. So you can really get down to almost a county level if you want to, but in general there are plants that are native to the Midwest. Um, that I think are, are very, very useful. And, and as, as you know, we're all focused a lot on milkweeds these days. This is a common milkweed. So one of the reasons to use uh, native plants is they're adapted to your local conditions. They were doing just fine here for 10 or 12,000 years before we uh, arrived and started worrying about our plants and worried about watering them and fertilizing them and cutting them back and doing, and you know, basically manipulating our, our landscape and our environment. So they're already adapted to the, to the local conditions, the local rainfall, uh, and usually after they're established, they don't require as much care. Uh, they will still always require some care because um, weeds that have come in from uh, other parts of the world are, still have to be managed. You still have to weed these gardens a little bit. But once they get established and if they're healthy, they can crowd out a lot of those other things. Um, they also provide habitat for birds and beneficial insects. Um, they serve as host plants for caterpillars. As you know, you know, the milkweed is the host plant for the monarch butterfly caterpillar, but there are so many others too. And as you start to dive into this and learn, uh, it, it's really one of the most enjoyable things about having a native plant garden in your backyard. Um, they also provide additional security and escape cover for birds. Um, they are aesthetically pleasing when they are um, when you make good choices for your backyard and get the right plants for the right places. And they also function as sort of a living classroom and museum. And by this, I, I mean, when I started gardening in my backyard with native plants, uh, one benefit that I found was, as I was learning identification, if you pick up a field guide, you're really just looking at um, the plant at its peak bloom. You'll find it when it's in flower. Well, when you have a backyard of native plants, you're gonna learn to recognize those plants when they're just coming out of the ground, all the way through their life cycle until they're dried and curled in the wintertime, you can still tell, uh, you can still identify those plants even when they're out of bloom. And, and that's really being able to walk outside, look out your window, see them day in and day out in all types of weather, different times of year, uh, is really a joy and it's, it's, a, it's a great, great learning experience. So biodiversity, what, what does that mean? Biodiversity means just the, the variety of life on earth uh, and, and the more types of plants that you have, um, the more types of wildlife, birds, insects that you, you will be able to attract and feed. Um, I think it's very important that we provide refuges uh, for insects. Uh, one thing, I have a friend who has raised a moth and butterfly caterpillar since she was a little girl. And uh, she always encouraged me not to overmanage my, my backyard habitats because she always, her quote was, a little slop is appreciated by the Lepidoptera. Because a lot of the butterflies do use some of those early, what we call early successional plants or even some weedy plants. So even if you have a place where you can leave some of those alone, that, that's, a, that's a benefit for, for butterflies and insects. So what happens when you plant all of these uh, native plants? This was a, a pipe vine that my, my friend shared me a cutting of her, uh, or a 
sprout of her pipevine plant. And I put it in my backyard and it took a couple years for it to grow up and grow over my, uh, my backyard fence. And one day I came home from work at lunchtime and found this uh, beautiful pipevine swallowtail laying eggs on that plant. And it was really one of those times where all the textbooks come alive. You've read all these things, you hear the lectures, you, but when you come home and you actually see that it works, uh, it, it's really one of those, you know, revelatory moments where you like realize that this is really worth it and it really does does happen. If you do the right thing, good things will, will come. So we talk a lot about pollinated insects these days that are getting a lot of attention, you know, not just of monarch butterflies, but particularly bees and some of these insects that uh, appear to be in decline uh, and are becoming harder and harder to find. And as you see uh, from this picture that the pollen grains are you know, stuck in the hairs on, the, on this, in this insect. And so the insects come for nectar and for food, and then they, in, in exchange, they move the pollen from one plant to another uh, for reproduction. So as you know, food production is very, very important in this country. You know, in, in this part of the country, you know, corn is essentially a grass. Uh, and so it's wind pollinated, wheat would be wind pollinated. Um, but there are a significant number of, of plants that do rely on uh, pollinators, whether they're native or honeybees to, uh, to do the pollination. Honeybees are not native um, to North America. They, they came over here with, with settlers, um, but they have become naturalized and many people enjoy keeping the bees and, and uh, harvesting the honey. I can go two blocks um, either direction from my house and find a beekeeper and I live right smack in the middle of town. So it's a hobby that seems to be growing, um, growing in interest as people become more conscious of where their food comes from and wanting to produce some of their own food at home. And they're also just really something else to watch. I mean, watching uh, honeybees in the colony work and watching the movements in and out uh, is really, really interesting. And anytime you've been to one of those uh, whether it's a, a, a food market or a plant sale where the, someone's got the frame with the, with the honeybees and the honeycomb where you can stay and watch it, people just become transfixed by that. So it is fun to watch nature at work in your backyard. That's one of the other joys of it. It's just simply uh, being able to observe and learn and watch the interactions and watch behaviors. So what should you plant? There are lots of guidelines for doing this. Um, this is a, there are a series of maps. These are from the USDA, but you could find these on the Illinois Clean Energy website uh, where they have some layouts for small gardens and they're extremely helpful. Uh, one thing that is often recommended is that you plant species in groups, uh, not necessarily evenly distributed like you would find in a prairie if you went to a, to a, a prairie restoration. Um, but actually planting the, the flowers in groups. There's a couple of reasons for that. And that's be, one is because uh, many insects associate with certain plants. So they'd have multiple food sources in one spot, which is good. The other is that you're, uh, anytime you're going outside the norm as far as gardening, I think it's really important, and I'm gonna hammer on this a couple more times today, is to, is to be intentional and to, and to make it clear to your neighbors, uh, and your community and anyone who said that this is an intentionally planted space. This is a garden. Uh, this has been planted with a purpose. Uh, I always encourage people to sign their gardens. Uh, you can get a lot of those uh, backyard habitat signs from various places, various organizations offer them. Uh, and also planting the, the uh, flowers in groups, you get these groupings of color. And I think that's very attractive too. So the landscapers call those drifts where you plant your, uh, your wildflowers in drifts of color. And we'll talk about that a little bit more too. So the holy grail, monarchs and milkweeds. Um, at the department, we are very excited about this because many, many, many species of butterflies nectar on common milkweeds. In fact, when we conduct butterfly surveys in the summer and we go to some of our very, very best nature preserve sites, we sometimes count the most butterflies along the road where the common milkweeds are. Many, many species use those as a nectar source in the summer. Uh, the only problem with common milkweed is it is a very tall plant. Uh, it doesn't look that tall when you're driving by on the road, but when it's in a very small backyard space, it can really appear to dominate. Uh, and they can, they can spread and be, be fairly aggressive. I mean, they're a very uh, a common plant for a reason. 
Um, they're not best for every single site, but in general, in the landscape, they're a really, really helpful nectar plant. And some of our biologists are actually counting on this interest in monarchs and the interest in milkweed planting and actually supporting some of our other butterflies that are becoming rare, providing more nectar sources for them too. And I think that's, that's a great side benefit. So in Illinois, we've got about, if I remember properly, about 16 species of milkweeds, the Sclepius genus. And on uh, the top left of your screen is purple milkweed, which you'd find sort of in a woodland edge setting. Uh, bottom left is green milkweed, which you'd only find in very, very dry sites. This is from a hill prairie in uh, Mason County. Uh, in the center is Swamp milkweed, this is one that you can find in garden centers. It's a very beautiful plant, grows in sort of damp, wet areas. Make sure you've got enough moisture for it. Um, the monarchs seem to love this plant um, to lay their eggs. Uh, when I have milkweeds in my garden, they seem to gravitate right to swamp milkweed first. Uh, upper right is the common milkweed again, and on the bottom right is the whorled milkweed, which is from a, a glade site in uh, southern Illinois. But you can see those leaves that uh, radiate out from the same spot Part, uh, same spot on the stem is what they call a coral. And uh, that's a relatively unusual one too, a grow in dry places. But there are, are many, many more as well. So this is butterfly milkweed and it, gets, it comes by its name honestly. Uh, it's got bright orange and sometimes yellowish flowers. Uh, butterflies love to, to visit it. It grows fairly low. Um, this is, it's got a great advantage. One is it's very attractive and two that it grows very low, it's not gonna get much more than knee high. And so if you're in, a, in a, an environment where you really can't have really tall things, and unfortunately a lot of prairie plants do get tall because they're competing with themselves, with each other out on the, on the open, open prairie. But this is a low growing plant. It, it flowers fairly early in the summer in June. And it is a great, great butterfly plant. So the one on the left is one more uh, interesting species, that's sand milkweed, that's from a, a nature preserve in, uh, in Mason County again. And it's, it's just, it's interesting to look at the variety. Uh, I'm not recommending you garden with all these, I'm just really show, just wanted to show you some of the diversity because we think of milkweeds, we usually think of the common milkweed along the roadsides, but there are many more, some that are good to garden with, particularly butterfly weed and, uh, and swamp milkweed. So resources are everywhere. Um, natural resources, we have um, pollinator packets that we sell through our uh, Mason plant nursery. Uh, I think they're almost already sold out for the year. Uh, the demand has been incredible and we're hoping we can increase production there. Um, but I just put several of these on the screen, some screenshots just to show you that there is a, a lot of really plethora of great resources out there. Uh, if you do a little bit of searching, you can find a lot of great information, great information on types of plants, uh, where they grow best. Um, and, and I think that's even in the uh, one in the center here where it's even talking about some annuals. So sometimes there are plants that are, they may not be native, but they're great annual plants for, uh, for nectarine. So for example, zinnias, which are a very, very common plant that would bloom in the late summertime. Um, I've seen places where those are planted in, in large groups that are just covered with butterflies in the late summer. So they provide good nectar sources and, and help attract them butterflies to your yard. So if you're gonna go plant by seed, uh, planting by seed is a process that requires a little bit of patience. You have to make sure you have good site preparation uh, and your weeds are eliminated. Um, and you can see in the picture, just the diversity of sizes and shapes uh, of prairie prairie plant seeds. And this is, you know, it's beautiful, but if you're, if you're the person who's pulling the seed drill and you're trying to get all these different shapes of seed through the seed drill and into the ground, it can be a really tough thing to do. I've watched uh, uh, prairies being planted where the, the driver has to stop and unplug and then go a little bit more and stop and adjust. Uh, it, it's tough planting big areas, but in, in your yard, you can either you don't want to plant anything prairie seed very deep. About a quarter of an inch is really all it takes. Uh, the main thing is it's got good seed soil contact. Uh, so, so pressing down after you've put those seeds in the ground. Sometimes you can prepare your site in the fall and eliminate the weeds, whether it's tillage or with herbicide. And then in the snow, you can just sow them out on the snow and let the snow melt and take them down and, uh, and basically sow them for you just like they would in the wild. 
but you do have to you know, have some patience, uh, give it some time. The first year, it's gonna look very weedy. Um, I'm just gonna tell you right now, if you're not using uh, plants, if you're buying plants, it's a different story, but if you're growing from seed, it's gonna look weedy for the first couple of years. That's where I think the signage is very important. Uh, a sign that says prairie in progress or pollinator garden or some reason that, that so, you're, uh, so your neighbors and your friends and the passersby know that this is an intentional project that's on its way. So again, a weed-free seed bed is important. Um, planting shallow, about a quarter of an inch. Uh, you can plant late May, early June. Uh, prairie, native prairie plants are what we call warm season plants. So the grass in your yard is a cool season plant, which uh, greens up very early in the year, goes dormant in the middle part of the summer, the hottest part, and then greens up in the fall again. And so, I do sometimes chuckle when people are trying so hard to water their lawns in the summer to keep the grass green because it really doesn't even want to be green in the summertime. It wants to go dormant and then come back in the cool time of the year because that's when it does best. Uh, avoid fertilizers. Native plants do not need fertilizer. Um, they do just fine on their own. In fact, some of them will grow in the crummiest soil in the worst places. Uh, we stopped at a roadside in Macoupin County and found a rare uh, blazing star one day and it was growing in, I swear it was growing in gravel. I mean, it was growing in almost no soil. Um, they grow in, in, in some really harsh, tough conditions, um, but, but really, really avoid fertilizer. They just, they don't need it. So I'd like to talk about some of the spaces that people can use. This is a little roundabout I came across in Des Moines, Iowa. I went to visit a friend and came across this spot and I thought it was really creative use of the space. Um, it doesn't always work because first of all, in um, Roadside and traffic situations, you have to worry about visibility. So this is a very low traffic neighborhood. Um, the road I'm on doesn't really go anywhere except you know into the residential area. So really does not get enough traffic. That, that would be a problem, but um, in a very high volume traffic area, you might not want something that would grow that tall. Uh, also out by your driveways and um, any place where visibility is an issue, I would recommend keeping those areas either with really short plants or to keep it uh, to keep it mowed back a little bit. So this is my, my friend Vern Lajessa's house. He lives just down the street from you. Some of you in Springfield know he's a executive director of Friends of the Sangamon Valley. And he's had his front yard in Prairie, you know, for as long as I've known him. Uh, they mowed the parkway between the sidewalk and the street, but he and his wife Charlene have always kept a native prairie in the front yard. And um, Charlene always jokes that Vern gets all the compliments for their yard, but when the weed notice comes from the county, it comes to her because she's the one the house is in her name. So theirs is a lot more of a sort of wild prairie restoration type planting. Uh, and you can see that those are sometimes, um, people don't always understand what you're trying to do. Rooftops are another option these days. More and more people are going to rooftop gardening. Uh, many of you are aware of what they call the urban heat island, where the temperature is just a little hotter uh, in urban areas than it is in the country, and that you know, rooftop gardening can help with that. This is a picture from the Chicago City Hall. It's from several years ago. And I'm pretty sure it's um, matured a lot since then, but I just thought it was a really creative um, and a beautiful, beautiful landscape on the roof of the building. Uh, you have to make sure that your roof um, architecturally and structurally will support uh, the added weight if you're going to garden on your rooftop. Uh, that's not something that should be entered into lightly if, if you're thinking about it. Another thing I like to preach and I've preached it today and I'll preach it again is to be intentional. Uh, this is a little prairie restoration in uh, Virginia, Illinois. They had a log cabin or two and so they did a little prairie restoration around it. And one thing I like is when people add something some feature that lets people know that this is on purpose. And in this case, it's the fencing. You've sort of got that uh, old time fence. You can see that they've mowed uh, some areas that need to be mowed where people want to walk. Uh, also that when you mow in from the fence, that serves as a fire break if they wanted to do burn management. But anything, you know, split rail fences are great. Anything that lets people know that this is you know, a historical recreation or it's, it's intentional, uh, that there's a reason behind it. So we talked a little bit earlier about planting in groups. This is a little bit over the top because this is at our uh, plant nursery in Mason County. So this is the purple cone flowers and prairie blazing stars. Um, but the, you can, the purpose of the image is to give you the idea of planting in groups of, of the same species to give that, that really wow factor with the color. Um, as you can see, 
comparing this to the prairie planting from a couple slides back, um, this has just got that impact and uh, it's very, very attractive. And I think that um, your neighbors would ha have a lot easier time understanding um, what you're up to when you have sort of an intentional and a planned look uh, to your prairie garden. Now, when it comes to weeds and pests, uh, any of you have, who have taken the test of the Department of Agriculture to get your pesticide applicator uh, license know that the first thing that they preach is called integrated pest management, which means you don't go straight to chemicals. Chemicals are at the last resort, uh, and the first, when you, when you start, you have to look at all other means before you would go resort to chemicals. Um, this is a, a common milkweed flower that was covered with Japanese beetles. I came across this on one of our butterfly surveys a few years ago and it really worried me because there's a time when we were just starting to think about ramping up milkweeds and here I find a milkweed that was covered with these. Fortunately, that the Japanese beetles have sort of come over the top of that curve and they're not as bad now. But in, in small spaces, especially if you're in your backyard, I, I don't think pesticides are, are, are really necessary because you can you can knock these off into a bucket of soapy water that's one one option uh, a lot of things can be controlled manually you can pull weeds uh, you can cut them um, uh, my dad likes to use a little bit of uh, vinegar uh, on his sidewalk cracks he doesn't like to use uh, pesticides if he doesn't have to and so there are there are some options um, occasionally you do get to to a place where you, you need to use a pesticide but again that has to be uh, the last resort. And I think anyone who's using uh, pesticides responsibly should follow this integrated pest management where you try everything you can uh, before you get to that point. I'm just going to run through just a few uh, interesting plants. One thing that's important is to have uh, visual interest from spring until frost. And so whether you're in the shade, these are jack in the pulpits in the shade, or uh, wild geraniums and woodland flocks, and then out in the, in the uh, out in the, in the sun, this is a prairie smoke and shooting star. Uh, the image at the right is not from a backyard. The, the one on the left is from my backyard garden, but the one on the right is from an Inchusa grasslands up in Northwest Illinois. But I just loved it because it had those um, that nice diversity of, of uh, early blooming prairie plants. So in the late spring and early summer, you can have your, your indigos. The white wild indigo is the one that's native to our area. Uh, blue wild indigo, which looks very similar, uh, but it has these beautiful blue and purple flowers, um, is also very, very attractive. It's native a little east of here, but it's a great garden plant. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to use it. Uh, spiderwort also is, is a beautiful uh, plant that blooms early, early in the summertime. So your common plants, in the summer, black-eyed Susans, uh, purple coneflowers, probably for butterflies, purple coneflowers and butterfly milkweed are about the two best things you can, you can use. Uh, many, many species uh, use both of those plants. In the summer, wild bergamot is another species that's it's a mint, so if you ever um, you feel that stem with your finger, it's a square stem. Uh, so that tells you it's a mint. If you tear those leaves and crush on your fingers, they have a very minty smell to them. Uh, these flowers are very, very attractive to bumblebees. Uh, bees are certainly, certainly a species, types of several species that we're watching these days. Uh, we have uh, the rusty patch bumblebee, which is federal listed, and some others that are candidates for listing. And so uh, wild bergamot is a great, great, um, great, great source for, for, for bumblebees. So lead plant is a prairie shrub. So this is one that's not so common for gardening, but it's got this very silvery foliage is where it gets its name. Um, but it's also a great butterfly plant. It takes a few years to mature. It's not one of those that looks, it doesn't look like a garden plant. Uh, it's nice if it's supported with some other things around it, um, but it, it does flower beautifully and a lot of butterflies and skipper species will use a lead plant. So speaking of skippers, so some of you may have seen these tiny little golden uh, butterflies in your backyards. There's a few that uh, occur in, in town. Um, they're sort of a, a super family of butterflies. So they're sort of integrated between moths and butterflies. They're sort of short, short stubby bodies, and, um, but they've got club-like antenna-like butterflies. So skippers are sort of that in-between. Uh, a peck skipper is one you might find in town, um, but they use uh, grasses normally for their uh, 
for their um, larval host plants. So anytime you can leave uh, leave some of that in your garden uh, when it when it goes dormant in the fall, not clearing everything away, uh, a lot of these insects will overwinter in that duff on the ground. Uh, so if we clear everything off, that's you know takes away some of that refuge in the winter time. In the fall. Uh, I think it's very, very, very important that we think about fall, uh, fall nectar plants from mon migrating monarchs. Say that fast three times. Um, monarch butterflies need milkweeds for their caterpillars. However, they've got a long, long way to go to get to Mexico. Uh, New England asters are beautiful plants. Uh, golden rods, there is the Canada golden rod that grows next to the roads. Uh, those are everywhere, but there are some others that are quite beautiful. Um, Stiff or rigid goldenrod is very pretty. Showy goldenrod and Ohio goldenrod. Uh, there are three really beautiful uh, specimen plants that are, that are great in, in gardens. Uh, providing this nectar source for migrating monarchs in the fall, I think is just about as important as milkweeds for caterpillars. So beyond plants, um, bees need, need nesting sites and habitat. Um, Bees may need nothing more than a crack in the ground. They may need some loose bark on a tree, uh, small cavities. Uh, there are a lot of attempts now to create some of these little small uh, bee nesting structures, which I think are kind of interesting. Um, and they add some visual interest to your garden too. And I found this one on, on the internet. This is not my picture, but I, it made me laugh and made me smile. Uh, it's a pretty darn big project, but I think it's, um, the idea of just using some creativity, uh, taking this issue and having some fun with it, uh, I think is one way we can, you know, gardening is supposed to be a hobby. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to help us reduce stress, uh, help us connect with nature. And, you know, you can, with, with woodworking projects, you can certainly uh, blend a lot, of, a lot of different hobbies and interests into one. So, on the other hand, I'm still working on, on my, my yard and trying to figure out how I'm going to um, landscape. And one problem I have being in an urban area with small amount of grass is that I have a drainage problem. And part of that is some seepage in my basement. Not bad, but I thought I might try and get some rain barrels uh, to capture some of the water and, and then direct it to where I want it to go. And so um, rain barrels are great projects, turning out to be the greatest uh, stay at home week project ever. I started to prime them last fall and I really didn't have a chance to work on them much until the recent weeks, but now I seem to have plenty of time on my hands at home. Uh, so what I did is I pr took these blue ones and we primed them to be white and then um, primed them a second time with a color that more or less matched the brick on the house so they would, and then I went to work decorating them. So these are great projects for kids or for you or for anyone who wants to just uh, have a little bit of fun and some relaxation and um, add some other visual interest to your, to your native garden. Lastly, we didn't talk a lot about birds and bird feeding, but uh, when your plants go to seed, they can really uh, feed the birds. I mean, any of you have watched a patch of prairie cone, or pale or purple cone flowers uh, be uh, worked over by goldfinches. I mean, they, they love purple coneflowers. They love sunflowers. Um, it provides great natural food sources. And another thing I would say about bird feeding is um, if you have bird feeders, and I've been feeding birds for years, is you always have to clean up under the, underneath the feeders with the, with the uh, husks from the seeds. Uh, one thing I've had tried to do recently was establish a small pollinator garden around my bird feeders. So I figured there's a place for the seed to fall uh, if the birds who want to feed on the ground can go in the plants, they're sheltered, they're protected. Um, I can still get in and, and rake the seed out, but it's not so visible. And I just made a few flagstones in uh, so I could walk in to, to fill the feeders, but it uh, did provide that sort of, um, sort of a natural uh, area where the seed could fall and it, it's kind of in its early stages, so I don't have a picture of it yet, uh, but I think that's one option for a very, very small pollinator plant is just to do a, a small planting right around your feeding stations, um, again, with some stones so you can walk in and change, change the uh, feed and clean them, but also a place for that seed to fall and for your birds to find some escape cover uh, and security. So with that, I guess I'm... Uh, open for questions uh, or thoughts or comments. Um, 
Lindsay and Elliot, anything you guys would like me to cover? I'm happy to do so. Uh, yeah, Chris, thank you so much. Um, just as a side note, I think we're hitting a record number of participants for our webinars, which is awesome news. And thank you, Chris, for doing this. Um, yeah. We had talked a little while ago about kind of dealing with, uh, you know, there are some municipal governments that have kind of pushed back on folks doing this. Just, you know, people think of traditional lawns, you know, just pretty green mode things. But there are some folks that see this as kind of a, uh, um, kind of an eyesore. But could you talk about like kind of your experience and what you would recommend for folks? Yeah, thank you for reminding me about that because I completely overlooked it. Um, I've had uh, calls at the office from people who wanted to leave a portion of their property um, in a wild state, perhaps not as a rest restoration, but just to uh, keep some unmowed areas uh, or to do some gardening with native plants and did receive some pushback from um, from their government officials, probably because one of the neighbors complained. Um, and so they're asking, you know, well, what can I do? How do I, how do I navigate this? And so wh what I always recommend is that they call the person back and they explain a little bit about what they want to accomplish. And they say, look, here are some of the things I'd like to accomplish with my property. How can I do that? Uh, working with you, working within the rules, what can I do? Uh, what can we do together to accomplish this? And I think if you call your officials and you approach the question in a way that's not confrontational, uh, it's not critical. I mean, I'm on the I'm on the <laughs> receiving end of enough of those calls. I will tell you that it's certainly appreciated when people call and ask how they can work together. And I think uh, that's always a really great option. I've also had communities call, you know, community managers call and say, look, we're looking at modifying our ordinances and what are some of the suggested lists of plants? Uh, what are some of the ideas for setbacks from sidewalks or, you know, where should they be placed? And, and so I've pointed them, you can go online and, and search for um, model native plant ordinance. And there are some places that have some draft language uh, that allow the show sort of a draft or a model ordinance that would allow some native plant uh, plantings in your yard, not just turf grass uh, that you can you can share with your with your uh, local officials. Uh, but I think awareness right now is very high because of the monarch, because of the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, I think awareness is at an all time high, and I think we're all in a much much better position to have those conversations with our officials. Uh, with our neighbors uh, again uh, you know being intentional about your work which is um, trying to figure out how to create a native pollinator garden that that looks planned looks managed um, and also if if you want to do a, a more of a sort of a native prairie look um, signage is always really helpful but then also calling and working with your with your local officials to see what it is you can do because I'm pretty sure that if you call up with the right and ask the question the right way, they'll, they'll find a way to work with you. Uh, and maybe it's just a matter of engaging the neighbor that's, that's unhappy because I doubt that um, your officials are gonna be out looking for those kinds of things if they don't get a complaint. So it's probably a neighbor communication issue. Uh, <clears throat> but looking online for draft ordinances that you might be able to use as reference uh, but again, I think a lot of it comes down to communication. So Chris, I've been monitoring the chat and there have been a lot of great questions, but I wanna encourage everyone to, to scroll through that because we also have some really great people on there answering those questions <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. quicker than you can see them. So oh, I, I saw that. one that, it, yeah, we, and we've got a lot of resources over there too. So we'll try to um, gather all those to send out uh, afterwards, but I saw a couple of people asking if you had any recommendations for um, partial shade plants because their yards don't have a lot of uh, all day lot all day long sunlight. Yeah, so that would be you know plants. If you're looking in, in the seed catalogs or online, sort of the savanna woodlands edge uh, plants. So some of those that would do really well in those um, types of circumstances would be penstemons. Uh, which are like all white flower. They, they flower in May and early June, and they're quite beautiful. Um, also, Joe Pieweed, which is a 
sort of a, a fairly tall plant, but it makes us a crown of sort of pink flowers in the in the summertime. And that's a great woodlands edge or, you know, an open woodland setting plant. If you have really nicely managed uh, woods in this part of the country, you will have to pie weed in it. Uh, butterflies love it. Uh, that's a good one. Um, some of the, that uh, pur purple milkweed is good for uh, woodland edges. Um, any of those sort of shade, shade plants, um, even shade plants need some sun. So in the spring, our spring ephemerals, the beautiful woodland wildflowers that we go out to see, um, one of the reasons that they grow and flower so early in the year is that they need to get enough sunlight uh, to be able to grow, uh, flower, set seed, and really finish up that cycle before the forest canopy closes in and, and the lights shut off to the forest floor. So light is always important, at least part of the day uh, or a few hours for many of these plants. Um, at the native plant sales, if you're looking for something that's like a ground cover, there's a, a wild ginger, which is a beautiful plant that'll, that'll spread and colonize <coughs> over the years. Um, that's a good one. Uh, the wild geraniums will, will form a colony too. Um, I always like, uh, I'm trying to remember the name now. They'll come back to me. But I would look at your woodland edge or any of your shade garden uh, ideas. I, I would like us all to move out beyond hostas. Uh, hostas are beautiful, um, but I don't think they have the benefits for, for butterflies and pollinators uh, that our native plants do. Thanks, Chris. I've got a couple more here in the chat. You want me to just keep firing them at you? I'll do my best to field them. <laughs> okay. Um, Christine says that she kept last year's milkweeds herbaceous layers for overwintering critters. Does new growth grow on last year's growth or should they be cut back closer to the ground to allow for more growth? Uh, you can do it either way. Um, in the walk. So what I would say is if you want to mimic nature is to perhaps do that on a, on a cycle every couple of three years where maybe you leave it and let it uh, come up through the, um, through last year's uh, growth. And then maybe the next year to clear it off or clear a part of it off. Usually when we're burning, we don't burn an entire site. We burn a third of it a year. So if you are looking at whether it's m management for mowing to keep a uh, woody, um, plants out of your gardens or or burning or whatever you're using to manage those sites and to keep them the way we want them uh, sort of rotating that I think helps uh, if, you, if it seems like your plants are having a rough time you know if you have to clear it you have to clear it out um, but any anything that we can leave I think um, it is beneficial for for some species that do overwinter in those uh, in that duff and in uh, near the ground <clears throat> Thank you. So, and then the next one is, when planting a garden in a backyard without fencing, are the recommended species of plants food sources for large animals like deer, possums, or raccoon? If so, how do you suggest protecting the plants from those animals? Hmm. So, uh, there's one company I know that has a seed company from Wisconsin that has a deer resistant uh, seed mix. And I think that I don't have a list of those plants in front of me. Uh, that would be resistant to deer, but they, uh, I think it's Prairie Nursery in Wisconsin. If you search them up, I think they have a, a mix that's a, a deer resistant seed mix that has plants that are less palatable to deer. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know if I can give you a guarantee. Um, fences, you know, deer, of course, you know, can, can jump just about anything. So providing a trying to find sort of a deer resistant uh, mix of plants is probably the best. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have that one in front of me. But I would, I would look at- Go ahead. Great, and I saw a lot of people were asking for recommendations for seed sources and a lot of people gave those recommendations in the chat. So Good. I will save you from having to do that. Um, I saw a lot of local, local sales recommended and Prairie Moon Nursery and a couple more in there. Good, yeah, those are good. Um, Great. And so the next question is, someone asked about the 20 by 6 garden design that you displayed earlier and mm -hmm. how it recommended full sun, uh, but also to keep the soil moist. And they're asking if you can speak to the water demands of such a garden. Well, so there's, that was just one example. So on that, um, on that site, there are gardens for all different conditions. 
So it's moisture conditions, light conditions. Uh, they have plant gardens for just about every, every possibility. That was just one that I pulled out as an example. And so that's for an area that would get a, a fair amount of moisture or a type of soil that would, would hold moisture. So, um, or maybe a low spot. So there are uh, garden designs for all different types of regimes, whether it's very dry, hot and dry, shady. Uh, that was just one I, I pulled as an example, basically to show the groupings of the plants and to create that intentional design uh, that your neighbors could would understand. So you know, as far as watering, I would say in the first year, you know, of course, when you put, uh, if you put plants in the ground, you're gonna have to water them in until they're established. Uh, one thing I was I'm going to experiment with my rain barrels is one of those soaker hoses that's porous where you can sort of loop that through your garden and let the water uh, soak out from the rain barrel uh, slowly. I haven't tried that yet, but that's what I'm really hoping to do. So that provides some moisture on a, on a regular basis for a new planting, but not uh, pouring water on the ground. Uh, I think that that might be a possibility. And again, I haven't tried it yet, but I, I'm going to give it a shot. Cool. Oh, and then Isa notes for us that Prairie Moon uh, has listings for deer resistant oh, great. Uh, plants. So that's pretty cool. Um, another question is what type of a prairie plant can I plant right next to my house? Um, well, it depends. I think if you're planting it next to your house, you're probably not wanting it to be very tall. Um, so I would say the purple cone flowers are great. Uh, those are um, that's a native that's been naturalized that um, many people use anyway, so that wouldn't even take any special explanation to your neighbors. Uh, Black-eyed Susans are another one. Uh, it's interesting if you look back at some of the old agricultural reports from the 1950s where they considered Black-eyed Susans to be an agricultural weed. And basically the guidance was just keep plowing them, eventually they'll go away. Uh, but Black-eyed Susans are a, a, a common native plant that look really great in gardens, especially in groups. Um, and the butterfly milkweed, I think if you've got a sunny spot that's not too wet, uh, butterfly milkweed is great. Do not overwater butterfly milkweed. I've had those that were looking, they weren't doing well and I kept watering them and then I kept watering them and I basically killed them because I overwatered them. So they're, they're adapted to pretty dry conditions. So if you do choose butterfly milkweed, pick a, a nice hot, dry, sunny spot, uh, water them in good you know to get them established but then you don't have to water them very much if, if you do water your garden during some really you know dry times okay but most of those native plants are going to once they're established they're going to do pretty well on their own great and then we've got a couple questions about your photography and what camera you use <laughs> <laughs> so um I have Canon cameras, so I have a camera, a Canon 80D uh, digital camera, uh, various lenses. Uh, most of the plant pictures are not taken with the big long lens. Um, when I'm hiking, I often use, I have a Lumix point and shoot, and I'm going to show it to you because I have it right here with me. So this is my Lumix point and shoot. It's got a Leica lens on, it's about $500. It takes absolutely great pictures, very high quality. And I fits in my pocket, and I carry it with me all the time. Um, as our phone cameras are getting better and better, at some point, um, those sort of professional grade point and shoots and uh, phones are going to just sort of merge. And I think people will probably uh, use most mostly use their phones because the quality is getting better and better. Uh, right now, my point and shoot camera still has a much better file for me to work on than my phone, but the phone's always with you. So you always have your camera. There's never the, oh, I wish I brought my camera excuse that we all used to use because now everyone's got a camera in their pocket and they're getting better all the time. Great. Um, I'm scrolling back up to see what people asked earlier. And I have a couple of folks asking about if you have any resources for if they're getting um, ticketed or in trouble or their uh, municipality is very against the native plantings. Hmm. Um, I don't know if I ever- I would say you could, you could get a hold of IEC <laughs> to 
point you in some direction. <laughs> so in the conversations I've had, I've what I've usually done, as I said earlier, was I suggested an approach that they take with the officials. And I said, look, if you're not getting anywhere with this approach, call me back and let's brainstorm something else. And I've never had a call back. So use I think so my anecdotal um, conclusion from that is that that approach that you use with those officials um, is, is going to be a big part of whether you're successful or not. Uh, and I do also think that, you know, the times that we're in with the uh, awareness of monarchs and uh, pollinating insects, I think, you know, we're in much, much better position to advocate for those types of things. But again, uh, not to just throw it in your um, neighbor's face. It's like, well, I'm going to plant a prairie. I don't care if you don't like it, but to, you know, work uh, some sort of a planning and a structure that looks attractive, that looks intentional, uh, that your neighbors who are walking their dog will understand they won't uh, get the wrong idea. Um, I think that's very, very important because we do have to live with each other. Uh, we have to get along with each other. We have to live with each other. We have to uh, um, try to help each other understand. And I can't help you understand if I put you on the defensive right away. Um, if I make an enemy out of you in the first five minutes, we're not ever going anywhere. And if I put you, if I call you up and I go, I can't believe you're, you know, if I just go confrontational on you, I'm not going to get anywhere. Um, and so I think a lot of it's approach and the type of conversation you have with the officials. And like I say, so, so far, no one's called me back for a second, second uh, consultation. Great. Um, the next one I have is uh, someone's asking, they say you hear a lot about leaving the leaves um, to leave that habitat in place for insects and other beneficial critters. Um, they're asking when is the right time to kind of clean up your yard and clean those things up and is it too early now or is there a right time? Hmm. Um, that's a really good question. In fact, you know, I, I even wrestled that in the summertime when um, when the lightning bugs are out and, you know, I mowed my lawn in the dark one night because the lightning bugs already lifted off and were flying around. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard question. Uh, what I might suggest is, you know, your neighbors are probably going to expect that you do some basic lawn maintenance. Um, and again, we have to live together. And so what you might do is choose maybe a part of your yard where you don't manage it that way right away. Say maybe your front yard that faces the street that your neighbors see when they're walking by. Uh, you keep that mowed and managed, and in the backyard maybe you leave the leaves as long as you can. Uh, I know there's a house near Washington Park here in Springfield where they have uh, bluebells uh, planted under the trees, and they let the bluebells, which is a, a woodland wildflower, come up and flower. And once they're done um, in May, then the grass kind of comes up, and then they they mow everything off, and it's a lawn again. But they do allow that to sort of run its cycle. So if you have a, a spot on your, in your property where you can leave things alone as long as possible, I think that's, that's really helpful. And again, if you've got a prairie garden and you can leave that be um, as much as possible, that will, that will help too. Thank you, Chris. Um, and then Isa in the chat says that sometimes it's recommended 12 days of 50 plus temperature um, oh, for that answer great. too. Great, thank you. This is great. I, I, there's a lot of experts in the chat. I'm, no, I'm, like I'm afraid I'm missing this is great. Of resources. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of education in the chat box about rain barrels and some sourcing for them and, and some good ways to use them. Um, does it? Yeah, you'll have to read it all later, Chris. Yeah, I can't uh, read it right now, unfortunately. Right. Does anyone have any more questions for Chris? I think I've gotten through, and if I if I haven't gotten back and read your question, you can retype it, and I'll read it for Chris. Anyway, I just want to thank everyone who's sharing answers and resources and ideas in the chat. I really, I think that's fantastic because that magnifies anything that I could possibly share with you, um, multiplies it so many times, and, and makes it so much more useful to everyone. And so. Thanks to everybody who's on here who's sharing their, their expertise and their ideas and their resources. That's fantastic. Yeah, you guys are, are really, really fantastic. The Conservation Foundation's in here. We've got some local seed sales. Like, this is great. This is really great. Mm -hmm. 
I know. Uh, King. Or, oh, sorry. Go Lizzie. ahead, Elliot. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say, um, Chris, you were kind of mentioning, like, obviously, there's been a big public um, kind of recognition of the importance of pollinators in general, and especially um, monarchs and stuff. But oddly enough, up until fairly recently, milkweed was listed as, I think, a noxious weed mm -hmm. under the Noxious Weed Act. And I was gonna see, did you have any involvement at DNR with? Kind of the discussions behind that because i know there was local pushback on actually changing that i stuff. don't believe i don't believe milkweed was on the noxious weed act i think there was legislation that was intended to keep it from being put on on weed uh, weed lists gotcha um, so yeah i think it was it was more of a preventive measure that as communities or counties or you know smaller jurisdictions were creating uh, guidance for, for their areas that they did not add milkweeds to that. Yeah, I, I, that. yeah no, I think it's just interesting to highlight just, I mean, I think it shows that, you know, folks are still learning and stuff. And it's cool that we're at a point now where this is becoming more normalized. So I think that's, I think that's kind of a great story to highlight. You know, and it is tough when you're recommending that gardeners plant plants with weed in their name. Um, that seems uh, a little incongruous, but um, a lot of those were, you know, viewed by people who were trying to get uh, farms established as that they were uh, competing for resources with, with crops and that they were hard to control. So um, times are different and we're fortunate to live in the times that we do where we understand, we're learning, not I'm saying we understand, but I'm saying we're, we're growing in our understanding uh, of the value of the resources that those plants, animals, and the diversity provide for us and make our lives better and richer. And, uh, and I think it's great that we have the opportunity and the resources and the people uh, to learn and share all these things. So this is a great forum for that. And then we've got somebody on the phone raising their hand. So I think Elliot, you can unmute them and let them ask their question. Hi, this is Julia Bunn. Um, I just wanted to say, um, don't forget Chris to mention rain gardens because they serve both functions of planting natives plus managing that rainwater runoff that is su such a, um, a challenge for a lot of communities now. So it's also another way to help change the uh, thinking of your uh, uh, local jurisdictions to see that you can actually help manage overages on stormwater by keeping it on your property using rain gardens and native plants. Thanks. That's a great point. Thank you so much for, for bringing that up. <clears throat> and I think one thing that I don't know people may not know about prairie plants is one of the reasons that they were so successful um, before settlement was that they are very deep rooted. So when you look at a prairie, more than half of, of that prairie is actually underground. And about a third of those roots die back every year, new roots grow, and they, uh, they're basically the building blocks for the soil uh, that we have in the Midwest, which is the best soil in the world with the uh, less <clears throat> rock powder as a parent material, plus the organic matter from all those prairie plants living and dying for 12,000 years we have uh, some of the finest soils in the world. And that's why our agriculture in the Midwest and in Illinois is so successful. We owe a lot of that to uh, those plants that have lived and died here for uh, thousands of years. And uh, I think it's great that we can recognize uh, their value and uh, make good use of them uh, wherever we can. Great, all right, I think we, it's 12.58, so I think we have time for one more question um, and I do want to mention for those of you, I think if you're on Zoom and you're using the chat function, there is three dots um, there and you can choose save chat. We are gonna to try to save it and pull out all these resources. Um, but if, if you are just attending, you might be able to save that chat to a folder um, for yourself. But besides that, and I've never used that function, so I can't, tell you how well it works so uh but like i said we'll try to gather all these things too but the last question i saw and i'm scrolling back up to find exact words um it was asking about light pollution on pollinator gardens oh yeah they're just asking if there's any thoughts about light pollution affecting pollinator gardens 
Um, studies are increasingly showing interference from artificial light at night with insect behavior. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I'm not familiar enough with that topic. I'm sorry. That's great. You had plenty of, of information on everything else, Chris, and I just want to give you a big thank you uh, for helping us out. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, Thanks to everyone who oh. jumped in and provided ideas and resources, and I'm very, very grateful to everybody. So thank you. Yeah, great job. And so then just some last minute stuff from IEC. Uh, we just want to thank you for joining our Lunch and Learn series. We've got more of these every day at noon. Uh, we help uh, we are hoping these keep you all connected during this difficult time and they'll be publicly available. I've posted that link in the chat a couple of times, um, but you'll uh, also get that in follow up. If you're not already a member of IEC and you're able to give, please consider joining today and you can use the link that we're going to post in the chat box um, right before we end the webinar. Um, and like I said, thanks again, you guys. We had like 109 people in here at the Ooh. top um of our of our attendance i didn't want to tell you that in the middle chris didn't want you to get nervous but uh, we appreciate <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your time we appreciate everyone that got on here this was a really fun one so thank you so much thank you and chris you can't see him right now but you're getting a ton of thank yous and your pictures are beautiful and people <laughs> love this and really found a lot of value in it in the chat Great. box well thanks i'm Appreciate being able to be here. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, Elliot, I think you can end the webinar from your end, right? Yep, yep, I'll go ahead and stop it. Again, thank you everybody for joining. This was really cool and we will be getting out notes and videos and all that fun stuff to people after we conclude here. So again, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. All right, have a good one, everyone. Thanks everyone.